So first up is public comment. This is comment on anything that's not on the agenda. And just so folks know, this is a um, brief statement, uh, usually to bring something to the board's attention or to get something out there that you'd like to see on a future select board agenda. So I see one in the audience. Yep, should I go ahead? Sure. Um, so my name is John Kaplan, I live on Maple Street. Um, and two quick comments or questions, I guess. Um, I know that the town has a plan to do some uh, sort of long-term capital planning around the paved roads in town, which I am very uh, supportive of that. Um, I am wondering if the town is planning on doing any maintenance to the recently paved roads, like uh, Prospect Ave or Elm Street that were paved in the last, say, three years. Um, I think both of those roads could really benefit from like some crack sealing because, for example, Prospect Ave already has a crack running down the whole length of it, right down the center, and if we don't take care of that in the short term, it's just going to get more moisture into the road base and break up all that expensive paving that we did on that project, um, as well as other recently paved roads. So that's just kind of a question, or I would encourage the town to be thinking about that. Um, and then my other question is whether the town has any plans um, regarding street trees in the downtown. There's a number of dead trees, um, like in front of Northfield Savings Bank. It's not very attractive um, in terms of, you know, getting new businesses in town and having people visit the town. So just something I've noticed over the winter and just kind of bring that to the board's attention. So I, I appreciate the time to bring those up. Thanks, John. Is there any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to approval of the agenda. So I, I just have um, had a couple of quick things for you. Um, well, really just one, which is um, with Josh Jerome's impending departure, We've mentioned in the packet before that we we're able to get some interim zoning administrator capacity through the Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission and their staff, it's similar to what I think Woodstock's been doing to, mm -hmm. to bridge their gap. So we will be able to get about 10 hours per week, so it'd be one day in. But what would make this um, sort of formally blessed um, and make sure we're fully capable would be essentially to add an item where you would name Stephen Bauer, who'd be the staffer assigned to us as the interim zoning administrator and then i would say make me the deputy interim and i would just be there as emergency capacity only so that if we're up against the statutory deadline and we need to sign something because steven's been called out of town we still have that capability i wouldn't necessarily be involved in any of the other elements of that job they would still run, run through that so if you guys would be amenable to adding that as say jay uh, under other business that would at least make sure that we can formalize that process and there's no issue with issuing permits or doing any of the statutorily required stuff. And training, okay. I would like to add appointment of a budget committee member because we have two vacancies. Trevor, we can't hear what's uh, very well what's being said there. I, I picked up on yours you want to add in a conversation about the zoning administrator? Yep. Pat, say that again. Turn so we're going to turn the mic up and see if that helps. Is that better, Trini? Yes. Okay. okay. Sorry. Um, I would like to add point one official appointment of one budget committee member. We have two vacancies at this point. Yeah, that would be under E. With the appointments, yes. Yep. This is different than the other appointments because the appointment of a person is usually elected. We'll pick it up under E. Okay. Any other changes to the agenda? If not, a motion to approve the agenda. This is Scott Perkins. Are you guys reviewing the alcohol licenses for the 
local businesses tonight? Uh, not during this. This is the select board meeting. The liquor control board is after the select board. Okay. We'll take them up then. Um, so is entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. Moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I would have a public hearing on the land use regulations. So we, we have an amendment to this um, based on that we got some additional feedback from the Planning Commission. They want to spend some more time on some of the provisions in the um, proposed changes to the bylaws, particularly with the minimum square footage. So the idea, because we'd already warned the hearing, we were pretty close to having it. And in case anybody showed up to speak about those other proposed changes, we keep the hearing sort of open with this. The intent would be that they would, if possible, and if you're amenable, once you close the public hearing, we'd essentially refer those changes back to them. They could then perform any of the work that they want to do to update those to make sure they were, they're where they want them. And then they would still have to do, if they make changes, we'd consider them probably the major variety would be a public hearing at that level, a public hearing at this level, so you're not missing any process steps either. But um, basically, that there wouldn't be action tonight. They want to do some additional work on them to clarify some of the pieces, namely the minimum square footage that's referenced in the hearing notice. And then at the end of it, refer it back to them for additional work. So no action. So that no action, yeah. You would just essentially through consensus refer it back for that. Because <coughs> it's one of those things where if you don't act, you've done the one piece that you have to do, which is hold a public hearing within a certain period of time. And so if you don't act and there are no additional changes and we go a year from from whenever the transmittal date was and, those, and you don't do anything, the proposed changes go away. So there isn't anything that you have to do, but you can take up anything that's amended when it comes back. Do we have anybody that is at the meeting that wants to speak about the proposed zoning changes? Is Sonny there? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm here. Uh, I agree with Trevor. Uh, we've had some uh, clarifications uh, specifically on the, uh, uh, the change to the gateway commercial building site requirement. And uh, it's it, it'll need some more study and and uh, on that particular item. So I'm in agreement with Trevor. Uh, we'd like to uh, send this back to the planning commission, and we'll rework it and bring it up at a at a, another meeting in the future. Okay. Entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Entertain a motion to send this back to the Planning Commission. I move that we send it back to the Planning Commission. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? You have it back, Sonny. Next up is the consent calendar, two sets of minutes and warrants. Make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second that All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up, presentation of the Maple Street scoping study. So we have Chuck and Jenny here with us from Dubois and King. They are, um, they've been working on the scope of work since its original version 2017-ish, 2018, somewhere in that era, I think this began. Um, back in October, we approved the amendment um, that led to these sort of uh, uh, two final tasks, or at least two final tasks for now, um, which would be the traffic impact analysis. So it's going to compare, compare the impact of one-way versus two-way travel, both on Maple and Highland, and then updated the cost estimates that are um, included in the packets as well. So there's going to be an overview of, of what this uh, final set of tasks was, or the that traffic impact analysis to show how those two scenarios could look on the ground based on observation data, modeling, all of those things. And so we've set it up so that Chuck or Jenny um, 
you, you've been made co-host so that there's a screen share component to what you, you want to do, you're able to do that. Scott Perkins, can you mute your line, please? It is muted. No, it's not. I can hear you. <laughs> it keeps popping up and taking over my screen. So, so Chuck, if you're ready, I think you guys are up. Okay, thank you, Trevor. So appreciate the introduction. So Chuck Goodling and Jenny Austin from Dubois and King. I'm the, I'm the civil engineer on the project and Jenny is our traffic engineer. And as Trevor said, uh, we were, we've been involved in this project at some degree for a number of years. The project's been on the side burner, so to speak. Um, but uh, we were tasked with two specific uh, items last late last fall, um, looking at traffic impacts, you know, what would happen from a traffic perspective if Maple Street was made one way in the direction headed east, and also what would the cost differential be um, conceptually in terms of a one-way versus a two-way option. So we did that work and we summarized uh, those items in a memo, a two, two separate memos that went to the town Back in February, we chatted with Trevor about that and he wanted to get us in front of the board here this evening. So we're happy to report back and about those two items. And so Jenny uh, is gonna speak first about the traffic and she does have something she wanted to share on the screen. So Jenny, you have the floor. I can't. She's in control. Is she muted? Well, she's sharing the screen, so she's there. You need to unmute yourself, Jenny. That's what I thought. There Thank we you. go. Sorry about that. Um, should be used to that by now. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so as Chuck mentioned, I'll go over the, the traffic piece and then he's gonna talk about the, the cost estimate for the two different options. So in terms of the, the traffic impact assessment, there were three, um, three steps basically that we took to get to, get to the end product. Um, the first one, the traffic volumes, we went out in November of 2021, did some traffic counts and the three intersections that we're looking at as part of this. Um, is the Route 12 and Highland intersection, and then the two intersections on South Pleasant Street, one with Maple and one with Highland. Um, so those are the, the three red circles there. So we um, did some traffic counts and adjusted those to come up with what we call the design hour volumes in the, the traffic engineering world. So those are our, our analysis periods, and we took a look at the AM and the PM peak hours, we did some traffic counts. And then um, when we're starting to um, pull all of our data together and got going, um, we saw that it, it appears that the midday is also, um, isn't something that we always look at, but um, we estimated midday volumes as well based on um, other VTRANS um, traffic counts that they, do throughout the state on a periodic basis and came up with um, design hour volumes for the year 2021. And then for evaluations, we looked at two scenarios. We looked at one with um, existing conditions, essentially, you know, two way traffic on Maple Street for the length of the road. And then the second one, we looked at the, the one way eastbound option for um, a good portion of Maple Street between Wiggett Street and the South Pleasant Street intersection. Um, so the, the main way that we typically evaluate to kind of come up with an estimate of, you know, comparing, comparing alternatives um, through the analysis is we come up with what's called the, the level of service at the, the intersection and along the approaches. 
And that's basically a, a qualitative measure that we can use to come up with um, estimating how the intersections are functioning. And um, so in the, in the modeling of that, we come out with um, results level of service A is really the best, uh, best option where the, the level of service is also um, based on the, the average delay that a vehicle would be stopped at the intersection before they're able to, you know, to make that left turn or right turn through the intersection. Um, for these are both, um, or all three of these are all unsignalized intersections. So obviously on Route 12 and South Pleasant Street, um, there's already free flow, you know, moving freely on the main route. You might have to wait a little bit if you wanna to make a turn at the intersection. Um, so level of service A for unsignalized intersections is assumed to be a wait, a delay time of less than or equal to 10 seconds at the intersection before you're able to make that movement. And then that goes down the alphabet down to level of service F, which is obviously, you know, kind of the, the worst case scenario where you're waiting more than 50 seconds at the intersection before you're able to, um, to make your way through the intersection to make your desired movement. Um, so we did the analysis and um, the, the traffic analysis results are shown on this table. There's a lot of numbers and letters there, um, but the main takeaway is that, um, so kind of stepping back a little bit for the, the one-way segment. So obviously, um, you know, we took the, the vehicles in the design hour volume that we were getting at the, the Maple and South Pleasant Street. And um, you know, obviously we're not letting um, westbound movement on Maple Street there. So essentially we rerouted, um, trying to be conservative, assuming that all of these um, vehicles, um, instead of making a turn at Maple Street, would go up to Highland Avenue and um, proceed to where they're um, looking to travel to. Uh, obviously there, there might be some that, you know, would continue on to South Pleasant or, you know, might not like the idea of making that turn. So they might, you know, make another route altogether, but um, to be conservative, assumed that all of the, the traffic was going up to Highland and then over to, um, to Route 12 from there. And then we also, um, because there are a number of residents on Maple Street within that section, which with the one way um, would only be able to go eastbound, would be able to go westbound. So we took a look at the volumes at, um, so we do not have a count at the, the 12 in Maple, but we did look at um, B trends counts to kind of make an estimate of um, you know, the, the percentage of the residents that were already going to, to Maple Street that might need it or to um, South Pleasant Street that might need to get rerouted that live along that section. Um, so that kind of played into the numbers as well in terms of how much traffic gets rerouted over to Highland with the, the one-way scenario. And the results we found was that there's not a lot of um, existing traffic during the peak hours currently on Maple Street. Um, so these two graphics, these just show the PM peak hour for existing conditions on the top and the one-way segment on the bottom. We also have volumes for um, the AM and the midday, which um, are somewhat similar. Obviously, the you know the direction might change on, especially the um, you know Route 12. The directionality might change during the AM and PM, but in general, um, the traffic on Highland and Maple is um, somewhat consistent between the AM and PM and the midday peak hours. And we found that the the level of service. Um, for all of the approaches. So this table here, um, when we do the analysis, it spits out um, the estimated operations for each approach of the intersection. At the, the level of service um, was estimated to be a level of service A for all approaches during both the existing um, two-way um, along Maple and also the one-way segment scenario, except for the, the Maple Street approach at Route 12 was level of service B. Um, and there's a lot of numbers in there that you might not be able to read them, but um, so level of service B is uh, average delay between 10 and 15 seconds, which is still pretty low. And um, if you can read the numbers in the table there, they're somewhat smaller, but 
um, it's still the highest number in there is under 12 seconds. So it's still, um, you know, pretty reasonable delay and definitely meets, um, you know, any level of service from a level of service policy standard level of service key is still considered good. Um, so the minimal increase and in the average delay um, it's pretty low. I think the the um, the highest I think was two and a half seconds increase from going from the two way to the one way, which is pretty minimal. Um, it's not shown in the table there, but we also looked at um, what the expected queues are. So um, essentially, during the peak hour, how many you know cars are going to be stopped waiting at the intersection to move through, and that um, was pretty minimal as well for all. Um, all scenarios under all hours with two or, or fewer vehicles, um, which was the biggest increase, I think was still less than, than one car length increase with the one way segment. Um, so in conclusion, um, you know, the, the, from a level of service analysis standpoint, um, both roads still function well under, under the one way scenario, there was really, um, minimal traffic impacts from, um, from an analysis standpoint when we took a look at this. And I will um, go to the next slide and I'll turn it over to Chuck. Okay, we can, we can return to questions maybe when we're done. So this is the cost estimate portion. The, the basic, the fundamental question was, you know, we have to understand we're at a conceptual level here. We do not have final design plans, final quantities, that type of thing. <clears throat> but conceptually, you know, what is the cost differential between a one-way and a two-way option? And uh, we looked at that. Um, we the, the, the overall project includes utility replacements, sewer lines, water lines, uh, storm drainage we did not take that into account because in theory, those subsurface utilities are, are common to, to either alternative. So the costs that we're talking about are not total project costs. They're really just the, the surface of the road, the surface costs, if you will. And uh, the cost associated with utility improvements is not accounted for in the numbers that we're gonna talk about here. So I wanted to make that point. Um, in terms of the layout of the project, um, the one way uh, option would start at the hospital and head to the east on, on Maple Street. Um, and the one way option, we were looking at a, a single 14 foot wide lane. Uh, we would have a sidewalk. Um, the, the plan is shown there kind of on the side, but on the, on the north side of the road would be a sidewalk. Uh, the two way option, um, would be two 12 foot lanes or a 24 foot wide road. So that's the difference in width between the one way and the two and the two way. Um, so wanted to point out a couple things of interest um, as, before we get to the cost. One is the right of way width, the available width on uh, Maple Street is quite narrow. It's 20, we think it's a, it varies in some locations, but it's approximately 25 feet wide. So this is a, we're starting with a narrow right of way. Um, and the, the, we believe the one-way option can remain within the right-of-way width that is there, but clearly the two-way option most likely would not remain within the existing right width. So there would need to be some easements, some permanent easements associated with the two-way option. Uh, so I wanted to make that note. <clears throat> there are a number of utility poles along the, ro the, the road, and you can see on the plan view, there's some red circles. Those are essentially where the poles are located. You know, right now they're right at the edge of the existing road. If we were to put in either the one-way or the two-way option, those poles are gonna need to be relocated uh, to get them out of the way to make room for, you know, either option we would probably move them to the south and try to keep them within the road right of way, but push them as close to the road right of way limit as we possibly can. Uh, so there's a pole relocation aspect to this project, which invariably adds time to the schedule. Uh, my understanding, although frankly, we haven't totally confirmed this yet, but my understanding is pole relocations that remain within the right of way, um, the utility company uh, you know, will, will pay for those 
those relocations. And we'll need to confirm that as, as the design uh, picks back up and, and hopefully is advanced. Um, but there is a, there's certainly a pole, utility pole ramification of either option. There also are trees on both sides of the road. Uh, we didn't do an exhaustive analysis here, but um, you know, there's gonna be impacts to trees, either trimming uh, associated with the pole relocations or possibly even removal. Um, the two-way option certainly has a bigger footprint and has more of an impact on trees. So again, that's just a factor as we talk about the project that the impacts the trees will be impacted uh, certainly. Not to say we couldn't be replacing some trees, but the trees that are there, there would be an impact. Um, looking at the costs, again, focused on the surface of the road and, and the, the alternatives included, the, the roadway width, the sidewalk, curbs on both sides. And you can see in the bottom left corner, again, sort of big picture with some contingencies and, and a little bit of conservatism. You know, we're looking at about a hundred thousand dollar difference between the one-way option versus the two-way option. So, sort of big picture, that's the difference in price uh, cost on the project between those two options. With that, I guess uh, maybe Trevor, turn it back to you, or to any questions, we can uh, revisit any of this or talk in further detail. But uh, I guess we'll open it up for questions at this point. Yeah, Trini, I have some questions. Go ahead, Larry. Um, so you're, you're showing the in the diagram goes between Wigan and Earl, but the, the reconstruction would go all the way to South Pleasant. So do your do your costs and analysis um, include going that distance, or is this really just between Wigan and Earl? Uh, well, th this is the cost of the roadway the surface roadway and sub-basin pavement and curbs and sidewalk from South Main to South Pleasant Street. So it's the, it's the full length of the project. Okay, thank you. And you, you say that the, the, the right-of-way is generally 25 feet wide. Are, are there places where it's um, less than that? I, I know it's wider than that from Main Street down to the approximate South Street area. Uh, I don't remember the width, but it's a more traditional road right of way in that area. And then it, it once you pass South Street, I think it's Wigan, then it, it narrows down. Um, if yeah, the information we're basing this on, frankly, is town tax map information, rel readily available information on the right of way. We did check that with the town just to sort of check things because it was a relatively narrow. It may vary slightly. I mean, so there may be areas that are less than that, but it, our understanding, it, it would be a minor variations from the 25 foot. It's essentially 25 feet. It may vary slightly over the length. Okay, because I, I would suggest that if we have 25 feet, we could have a 20 foot wide road and a five foot wide sidewalk and fit it in the existing right away. And, have our cake and eat it too. Yeah, don't disagree. Um, you know, there are there are uh, six inch wide curbs, so there's a foot of curbing, uh, you know, to take into account. And the utility poles as well. I mean, the, a pole is approximately a foot in diameter. And normally we would try to place the road side of the utility pole about 18 inches behind the curb just to try to help plow the plowing operation and so forth, not to be hitting poles as they're plowing the road. So you, you take into some of those accounts and it, it gets a little bit, little bit uh, skinnier, so to speak. Um, so those are some of the other factors that we take into account. Sure, sure. I, I, I'll just note that we could make it even, even narrower and that would be, um, it would probably preclude any on-street parking, but there's not a lot of on-street parking currently and um, given the complaints around traffic and, and, and excess speed along that long stretch, um, if we had a narrow road, it would probably go a long way towards um, traffic calming. Uh, don't, don't disagree. I mean, there's all kinds of traffic calming uh, features that can be brought to a project, project but a narrower road does certainly translate to slower speeds. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Can I ask a question in the, in the public? 
Yeah, we have one in the room, Cheney, from Rich. Okay. Hello, my name's uh, Richard Doolin, and um, I didn't hear, I haven't read your report, but I didn't hear anything um, on the emergency aspect of getting, you know, if you make the road narrower, getting a uh, fire apparatus, uh, the response of the fire department, uh, is that gonna change the route to somebody's house if you do it one way, make a longer response time, also uh, EMS, um, and then the police themselves getting in and out. Um, so that's, that would be a concern for myself, uh, you know, just the, the time-wise and during snowstorms and piled up snow, narrow roads, that could be an issue. And then the, uh, have, have you talked to the residents, each and every uh, homeowner, if they're on board with this project or not? And that's all of my comments. Another question in the room, Trini? Yep. Did um, anybody have an answer oh. before we move on to the next one? <laughs> I know that we have talked with the fire department and they wanted the road, if it went one way, for it to be going west, not east. Uh, they wanted the quicker access to the hospital instead of away from the hospital. That was the only feedback I remember from them. Okay, well, that's, that was my, I see, I didn't know that they had um, responded. Um, so that's, that's a good response. To, mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent prior to last April, say, but one of the things we were provided from the Maple Street neighborhood was a contact list. So we've sent certain things out about, you know, such as a notice about this particular presentation. I think there have been different contact points in the past. Um, there's been some level of outreach that is anticipated, I think, in every scenario to continue as we move. And I think this is the important piece. We're still very much in a conceptual, you know, which path do you want to take sort of moment in the project. And as we get farther down um, the road, no pun intended, it's, you know, we start to develop details. Some of these other conversations would, uh, would start to take shape and, and really dig into, you know, what does it need for response times? Does it all sort of fit? Um, you know, what happens with utility poles? What are the underground costs? What's the timing? Um, so it's it's very much I think going to be iterative. We're and we're still kind of in a early to mid iteration when we think about proximity to to a construction standpoint. Say, did you see and notify people on the street? Yeah, we had a mailing list. We sent something out Friday. Friday. At, 420. And the only response we got? No. No. I'm, I mean, I'm the only one here. Yeah. I saw, I saw a couple of neighbors on the. That are, I, see, I thought I saw some from the yeah, neighbors. I can't tell. Mm -hmm. May I ask a question? Is that, I don't know if that's appropriate, but um, I have more than one question. <laughs> um, so um, I guess. And at first, I would like to say that I support what Larry suggested about a narrower width. And I believe that most of the residents on the street would support that as well. We've gone out, we've had neighborhood meetings and gone out and looked at adjacent streets in the neighborhood um, with a tape measure. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not presuming to speak for everyone on the street, but I would, my guess is the general consensus would be supportive of narrower. Um, and that having the sidewalk is more important than a wide street. Um, so I guess I have kind of a sh maybe a sh more short-term question. I saw in the agenda packet there was some discussion about kind of an interim, you know, um, paving possibly of the street. Um, and I saw that a time frame in there, and maybe I misinterpreted this, but it said that it may be worth it to do some interim treatment to the street if it's going to be three to five years before the actual project comes along. Um, if you've been out there, it's way beyond pothole repair at this point. Um, you know, on the one hand, the 
the condition of the street does keep the speeds down. <laughs> um, but I think most people would agree that it's not really acceptable in its current state. So I guess that's kind of a question about how the board or how the town is going to decide what the next immediate steps will be. And then I am kind of discouraged to hear three to five years for the full project, because I believe this has been talked about for, I don't know, we lived on that street for 27 years. So um, I don't think it's been quite that long. Um, but it's been a long time, and I know that there's been kind of ongoing issues with, I don't know if it's water or sewer, but just past, just east of our house, I've seen the town out there a number of times, so there's some issue that's going on there. Um, so I guess I'll stop there. That's a couple of questions, kind of, you know, the overall, like, what are the next steps? That That's kind of a, a main question I have. So just to start that, I didn't see Maple Street on the list of of roads when we got the last list from the Capital Budget Committee before they kind of dissolved. Other than this project, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I don't remember seeing them on for a temporary fix. No, that was that was something I, I raised in the packet, Trini, just in talking with, with John, who's here as well, Shangra, um, and thinking about the project timeline and trying to figure out realistically, regardless of everything that, that has or hasn't happened, realistically, where are we right now? And what does that mean in terms of getting where we want to go? And so this is one more piece of information that helps us solve that puzzle. But if we're realistically between, you know, we've got, say, $600,000 in cost for these, some components, and if we have even that much for the other components, we took, look, stormwater, water, wastewater, we don't have a million two laying around for the project, so we're either going to have to go seek funding, we still have to do design, develop the scope, so we may naturally be, when you just link it up in that frame um, a few years out, so if we are, given the pavement condition, given the, the relatively healthy um, state of our pavement reserves, one of the things we could do this year, if we think we're three to five years out, say, is do an overlay. It'll help with winter maintenance in particular from, from another perspective. Um, and then uh, at a minimum, we could put it into the paving bid and see what it would cost in this era of volatile prices. And then that at least improves the quality improves the ability to maintain it and um, tries to marry it up with what our realistic schedule might be moving forward. If we get lucky, I mean, the risk is that we spend the money, we do the overlay, and we, we get lucky and find, we've defined a full project scope to have a full cost, and we come up with some money from one of the, probably one of the federal buckets that's, that's out there, whether it be a, an earmark or through an infrastructure bill or whatever. Um, but we, we don't have that identified currently, so. Just trying to think of ways if we we don't know our schedule, but we think it might be farther out. What does that mean for other options? And just wanted to make sure we raised them and presented some options related to them. But have we? I I understand that the road is rough, and I get that. But we've heard from other people that theirs are too. I just want to make sure we're not jumping this one to the top if we have others that. You know, we should be ranking these and prioritizing versus just going to the squeaky wheel. Um, we started in 2016, we were on the docket. Does that matter? The question is, where is it at now? It is the question. And, and we are going to do the, the, the paving condition index and the inventory that's on the you know, the spring project list, but we just, we don't have that breakdown now, you know, at this point, we have to go out and do that assessment. Um, so at that point, we'd be able to say, where does it, you know, what's its score compared to everything else? And so that's, that's in the works. We just don't have that data point. At this point. Really well. Yeah, it sounds like we're going to have to look at it. Can everybody just check and make sure that they're on mute if they're not talking so we don't grab the background noise? Thank you. John has another question. Oh, 
Mm -hmm. Joanne McGinnis. There we go. I got it. May I ask another question? Yep. Go ahead. Um, so it sounds like Du Bois and King's current work as they are committed to is now complete. Is that, I guess my, my question, I'm trying to find out like sort of, you know, what needs to happen to keep the ball rolling? You know, understanding that the actual design is gonna take, I don't know, we could ask Chuck that question, six months, who knows? Um, so I'm just trying to find out like, what is the sort of commitment of the town to keep the project moving? You know, at a minimum level, some of the next steps include identifying those utility-related costs. So the water, the wastewater, any of the stormwater pieces, um, and then showing up things like the utility and then moving sort of into a design phase. And so this was an amendment. These two pieces were part of an amendment to that original scope of work. So I, I believe we are at the end. Of, but anybody who was here sort of longer, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe we are kind of at the end of the initial plan run with these amendments. Um, we'll, have to, we'll go back and check and make sure they're already done task. To me, this is Pat. I have a couple of questions. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Pat. Um, Chuck, I understood you to say that you were looking at the sidewalk along the northern side. And right now, it's partly on the northern side and partly on the southern side, isn't it? It's all on the southern yes. side. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's sidewalk in front of Jocelyn House. Isn't it? No. Yeah. Well, absolutely sort not. Of. Not really. a, there's That's a very a short stretch, but it's not really a sidewalk. <laughs> yeah. So, it's all on the side. Be changing sides. Who, who says it's changing sides? This is very, this is very conceptual. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Pat, I guess I'll, I'll chime in. I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but about the side with existing sidewalk. I know that there's an existing sidewalk in portions of the area and maybe quite deteriorated in others. Um, again, the design is by no means completed, but we show in this version, we show the sidewalk on the north side. I believe it's on the south side in front of the hospital area. So there would be a crosswalk um, right at that uh, South Street area, which is right where the two lane would go to one lane, you know, one way un under the one way scenario. So it's a good spot for a crosswalk. It keeps the, it keeps the sidewalk on the hospital side, you know, up on the, on the Western end of the project and it moves to the North end on the center and eastern end of the, of the project. I kind of think the sidewalk on the north end gets better sun and probably is uh, maybe a little bit potentially less icy in some scenarios. It also goes by the Jocelyn house there, which is another potential factor. My, my other question Chuck is, I think I heard Jenny say that um, the overall conclusion was that it wouldn't have, if it was one way on Maple or two ways, it wouldn't have a big change on Island. That, that was the conclusion of your analysis. Yes, yes, there's a lot there's a lot of numbers and so on, but I mean fundamentally I think that's a correct summary. Um, the data we have and the analysis that we did doesn't show a dramatic or even a medium level of impact um, of one one option over the other. There, there are minor impacts, but I think I think minor is a correct characterization of that. Thank 
there any more questions or comments? Well, I, I, sorry, I came in a little late, but I, I want to say that it hasn't been paved. It's only been paved once, and that was when? When was that paved? Does anybody know? Fifty years ago, seventy years ago, and I don't know when the sewer and water went in. That's only been once, also. Was that 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago? Does anybody know? I would also say that on our street, on the hill, Hospital Hill in theory, um, we seem to pay our share of the taxes and our share of water and sewer. And I have asked how much does Maple Street pay last year? How much did Maple Street pay in taxes? And how much did they pay for water and sewer? So wasn't able to come up with that number. If anybody has it, that's lovely. Um, and because we were on the docket in 2016, because I saw it um, upstairs in the town manager's office. So we're now on our sixth year. Okay. Six year, so six years of us paying taxes and water and sewer times however many tens of thousands of dollars that just our one street pays. I was wondering if that matters to anybody besides me and you, John. Well, I, <clears throat> I think there's plenty of people in town that pay a lot in taxes and don't live on a town road too. So I don't know that that's how we judge projects and this <clears throat> this project was started and i'm not sure how it all got mixed mixed up but there was also a lot of conversation that needed to take place within the different neighborhoods because there was disagreement about one way versus two way some of the streets didn't want it to go one way because it was going to put more traffic onto their street they didn't want that so there was a fair amount of internal discussion within the neighborhoods that needed to take place too. So I think it's back on track. We're at this point um, and we're moving forward. So I guess what I'd like to hear now is what are our next steps, Trevor? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we need to do is um, we need to figure out what the cost would be for those subsurface utilities, we need to start to flesh out what the whole cost budget would be, um, and from there, what that timeline would be. Because I think cost is going to dictate timeline, because this is going to come down to what resources will be available at the moment that we're ready to go. And so, this is another piece of the puzzle, but there's still detailed work to be done. And I think there's still some maybe engagement on the design and the different options for the for the roadway itself, but we at least have a sense of what those entail and what the cost would be. Um, and so to really start to advance, until we have a total project cost, it's hard to answer the two questions of, of um, you know, when and what. Um, um, and so we, the, we only the, have the half of that. The scope, that, the scope that Dubois and King had was to take it to this point. Is that correct? Or does their scope have the the costing of all the utilities in it also. The, the scope that was originally laid, and this is four, four or five years ago, the, the definite, at the time that we responded to an RFP from the town, the, the, the development of the project was very specific. Um, it was one way in a certain direction. And I mean, those things were defined by the town at that time. So we responded to a very specific scope of work, which did include all of the design and permitting for the project. So at the end of that, we'd have essentially bid ready, you know, final stamped plans, and we would have the permits that are needed to build the project. Um, we got into that about maybe 15% of the way uh, we did, we did the survey and we did a conceptual layout of the project as defined, which was the one way, you know, approach. And that's where um, other other voices were heard, and and the, the project just stopped at that point. So, 
we literally haven't touched this other than this amendment piece for, you know, four, four years now. Um, so, you know, I guess, so yeah, our original scope does include uh, cost estimating and so on, but it's for a specific project. And that project didn't include an evaluation of alternatives and so forth. So there's some subtleties there. Um, if, if we can pick, if we can pick the project that we want to design, we can, we can pick it back up, but uh, I guess I'm not totally sure if we're at that point yet or not. So um, utilities, uh, the cost estimate for utilities shouldn't change that much, whether it's a one-way or a two-way street, right? Other than if it's gonna be impacted by the placement of a sidewalk. That That's correct. Uh, I think you're right. I, um, the, only, the one thing that comes to mind is the stormwater. Um, I believe there are certain stormwater treatment requirements if there's disturbance more than an acre, and this project was right on the line, right on the limit of that. And we may be in one permitting scenario with a one-way street, we may be in a different permitting scenario with a two-way street which could even include an off-site stormwater detention basin. Um, that was an alternate in our scope of work because the, the potential for that, you know, even existed four, four or five years ago. The, the stormwater rules have all changed since then, but that was at that time was still a potential. So the cost of the utilities, at least in terms of the stormwater, may vary depending on the one-way versus the two-way. But, you know, the water main replacement and the sewer replacement I think would be pretty straightforward. So Trevor, it sounds like what we need to do is um, get an actual meeting together with the neighborhoods up there and figure out what our preferred alternative is of this. Are we gonna keep it a two-way street? Are we going to a one-way street? Um, and. I think it would be beneficial from the town's perspective if we kind of had at least a rough idea of what we're talking about here for cost. You know, the I know it's easy to say the difference is $100,000, but I think your cost estimates are extremely low um, for what we actually are going to need. And I can tell you from experience that putting bids out right now, they're coming in in two, three, four times what the engineering estimates are. So, you know, you're two-way street is probably creeping up towards a $2 million project right now in the environment we're in. And so that's without any of the utilities. So I think it's, it's in our best interest to figure out what this number is. And, and I don't think it's something that we ought to be slow on because all your, all your grant funding is opening up right now. And we're sitting here, you know, just, taking baby steps. I think we really need to engage somebody to get this sorted out for us, get us a good scope, plans and budget so we can go after some of this grant funding and get this project done. It's, you know, if it, we got to deal with some right away, we got to deal with some right away if we need to, and you know, and maybe not everybody agrees, but if we got to take down 12 trees, then we got to take down 12 trees. I mean, it's, we either need to move this project or figure out something else. It's, but we're not going to move it if we don't take that next step. And I think we got to, we need to take that next step and figure out how much money do we need for this and what does it look like and what's the preferred alternative to the users of that. And the neighborhoods are important, but there's others in the town too that should have a say in what that is. And granted, we don't live there, but we do help pay for it and we drive through there. So, you know, I, I think we need to to move this to that next place. Does that mean we have to renegotiate a scope of work with DNK? Yes, I think given the passage of time and just the scope of the project and picking it up and down and so forth, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a different different project now than when we first got underway and with the passage of time, sure, we, we'd have to, Define the project and 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 look at our scope and budget and see if it's adequate or if we need to make adjustments accordingly. So, Trevor, we probably need to look at the town's procurement 
policy and see if it's renegotiating with the existing or if it has to go back out if we're changing it drastically. But I'd, unless somebody disagrees, I think it's we need to pick up the pace on this one and get it to where we can go after some of these grant funds that are out there. You know, the town can't afford to redo these streets in today's bidding environment if it's going to cost us a couple million dollars a whack on our own backs. And this money isn't going to be out there forever. Somebody's going to end up with it. It might as well be Randolph. I agree, Trini. We've been talking about the street for 15 or 20 years, as I remember. So. That was before me, but <laughs> <clears throat> it'd be nice if you're not still talking about it after me. <laughs> 15 or 20 more. <laughs> no, no, no. All right. Do you need more direction on that one, Trevor? I think I got it. Okay. Holler if you need help. <laughs> um, keep this moving. We got a big agenda tonight. Um, consider election electing the ARPA standard allowance. So this is uh, the standard allowance is part of the final guidance issued by Treasury. Uh, a couple of months ago, I think they issued that. And what standard allowance basically is, it allows a municipality or a non-entitlement unit, or whatever we're defined as under this, this particular act. Um, if we have $10 million or less in lost, or that we can, we're essentially, there's a $10 million threshold for lost revenue. We're well under that. Our ARPA award that we've been given is 1.37 million and change. So we'd be saying essentially, through the standard allowance, declaring sort of all of this under that lost revenue category. And this is open for every community. It used to be to claim lost revenue, you had to go through a fairly specific and detailed um, worksheet that showed you know, how, it, how you lost those revenue pieces. In claiming the allowance, now that it's allowed, um, we have more flexibility in the use of these funds. We can use them for what are broadly defined as government <coughs> service. So that's anything we traditionally do. Um, so it provides the most flexibility. There is still that guidance to try to make sure that any use of ARPA funds does reflect some of the intention with the money, such as building toward um, you know, projects that have a resiliency component, for example. Um, and one that came up the other night that wasn't maybe as exciting as some others, but hit this, just to give you an example, was a, a, a project that looked at sort of a website upgrade, digitization records, and routing the, the capability to take payments online because that enables us to, if we have to close the doors during the pandemic or some other limited capacity situation, we can still offer quite a bit of the functionality of government you know, at a basic level, whether it be you know, dog license, records research, all of those pieces, and provide information on public health or any sort of other emergency components. We have a presentation at the ARPA committee from Katie Buckley at VLCT. She's their, their ARPA guru. Um, essentially confirmed that this was an option for municipalities. Lots are starting to put this on agendas, consider it, take it. I think I saw Barry Town was doing it. I think I saw it on an agenda for, for Woodstock as well recently. Um, Montpelier's at that point, I think they did it the other night, if I, if I recall right. Um, so it's becoming a more common action. There's a specific motion that's been recommended by the LCT um, that we'll use. And then what we have to do, why there's a time element to it, is that you have to declare that you're going to take the standard allowance in this first reporting period, which expires on April 30th of this, this month. So we are queued up to do that. If you take it, we'll go into the system, declare that. The motion seems to be all you need to do. The ARPA committee, which met with, with Katie, talked about it at his meeting on Tuesday night. They made a motion to recommend that we take the standard allowance as the option with a, a six to nothing vote. Um, so we have a recommendation from that group that you've tasked with digging into to some of the nuances and the details uh, of the ARPA funding. And then it will still go through the process that they're in, they're in the middle of creating in terms of intake, um, uh, you know, discussion, priority ranking, some of those pieces. So everything that comes in still goes through that same grist mill and then comes to the board, and then there may or may not be a, another public component after that, depending on what you want to do. But this would give us great flexibility in, in, in how to use those dollars, um, while also easing that reporting burden, too. Um, and it may help satisfy. We won't really know this part for sure, but if you recall, the original rule that's in this 
in, you know, the, in the, the adopted final rule um, and in the act itself is we have until 2024 to obligate the funds and 2026 to spend them. There's a thought that if we take the standard allowance now, we've at least taken care of the obligation threshold and that we've said it's all lost revenue, therefore we're going to accept it in and then consider it obligated at that point. We'll get clarity from that and, and obviously follow Treasury's guidelines, So, it, but it may hit another process marker um, along the way so that we're not worried about trying to figure out what ob constitute, constitutes obligation and making sure that we do that um, at some future point if we can kind of do it all in one fell swoop, which it, is the hope. Harry, anybody have any questions on that? If not, anybody want to make a motion? I'll make that motion, Jeannie, uh, from lines 83 through 86. Do you want me to read it? Do we have a second on that? I'll second, second that. All right. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I just check, John, are you there just for the excavator discussion? I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I'm just kind of, yeah. He heard how much fun you guys had. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't help so himself. excited to come. Could, <laughs> talk about it so, a bit. Um, let's jump down to item G on the agenda, and then John can either hang out or, or call it a day, because I'm sure he's had quite one. It's really um, good. This is ratifying the trade-in of the dozer and purchase of the excavator. So the basic idea here is we've got a good lead on a very, um, on an excavator that is in great shape. It's not terribly old. John can give you all the details on it. It has a, a you know, it's a um, functionally something that we've wanted for a long time that we would benefit from. We would use it in a lot of applications, but notably ditching and uh, culvert replacement. One of the things we can do to help lower the cost of this piece of equipment, which is around $70,000 for this particular used model, is we have a, it's a bulldozer from 1987, 86 or 87. It's still in good enough shape to have some trade-in value. Um, and this offers the one that maximizes that trading value, so we'd be able to get $12,000 back for that. Um, we're recommending splitting the cost between the highway equipment reserve for obvious reasons, but also the stormwater reserve because our primary deployment will be on those ditching culvert, those types of projects that are really about water quality as much as they are about road maintenance. And then it's always available for emergency situations for, for highway or for other departments. That's the backhoe kind of slide into sort of a, 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 a backline capacity um, and be more available for water and wastewater needs and may help at least help us limp that piece of equipment through as that's similarly aging into ailing. And so that's the pro proposal before you um, that we have that we've mentioned in one other form before uh, as sort of to make sure we weren't so far off the, the ranch that you were not going to let us back on. Um, and so that's the that's the proposal before and then the other thing that, that has come up since then in a similar vein that just wanted to mention to you and get sort of a, a general feeling about we also have an opportunity to pick up a street sweeper in a similar manner um, this is about a seventeen thousand dollar piece of equipment doesn't look like it's going to need much to be road worthy other than some transportation costs the reason we started looking at street sweepers in large part is that when we went out to Try to figure out if we could hire a piece of equipment and a driver. What was the first cost system we got back to? You so remember? I had a couple different, you know, contractors come in and just, you know, I bought them around town, show them the streets, you know, the curbable you know, street that they would be sweeping and whatnot. And he estimated there was between four to five hundred yards of material. So his price, both prices were really close. They were between sixteen to twenty thousand, twenty-two thousand dollars, just to get swept for the spring. You know, now that's you know like you said over you know four or five hundred yards of material on the sides of the road it's not like it's just gonna you know the sweeper's gonna go over the back it's gonna just it's gonna take time so mm -hmm. the, the only reason we started looking is because of like well if we're gonna spend this much money to sweep one time you know what could we spend to better ourselves you know so we could have longevity of the machine we could do you know spring sweep you know like say fourth of july we could clean the streets before you know braids and you know, mid midsummer, 
and even you know a fall sweep is pretty important you know to clean the streets best you can before the snow and everything like that falls so just just an idea but we came across this sweep for us in new jersey so you looked at a couple others and, and saw a few other models and we've you've been using a resource that that we've got in another municipality that has sweepers and has used them for years to try to get a sense of, uh, hey, this model, this unit, these things, what do you see, what are things we should be asking about? So we try to do some of that due diligence as well. But the idea being in a similar vein, we thought we'd pitch it under this one just to get a sense of where you're at is that, like John said, for the cost of one contract sweeping, just this year alone we could do three. Um, and there's a real water quality benefit in addition to sort of the aesthetic Maybe probably a little bit of an air quality benefit when you think of less particulate being available to be up um, <coughs> and out there. So try to be enterprising with, with some of these pieces of equipment and fit some of our needs. And then there's a possibility that if we needed to, um, or we were able to, to lend it or essentially rent it out to, to neighbors, for example, we might be able to offset some of the operating costs, if nothing else, um, as well. So the excavator is the primary one, and that, that's the one in motion. But we did also want to mention the sweeper because we can we can make that happen. There's just a little bit of a time element there as well, based on others might be interested. In. We'd have to arrange transportation and a few other things. Let's uh, <clears throat> take these one at a time. The first one is yeah. trading in the dozer and purchasing the excavator. Oh, I'll make that motion. You know how I love equipment. So, <laughs> more than happy to make that motion. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. <clears throat> Opposed? Motion carries. And now the sweeper. I'll make the motion to uh, uh, purchase the sweeper so long as it meets. I guess um, our expectations, which I've heard a little bit about this already, so and been a little bit involved in this conversation. So it seems like this unit that they found in New Jersey would fit the bill. So I believe I'll make a motion to fund that unit too, as long as Trevor knows where the money's coming from. I have a couple of questions first. Okay. Um, how, how old is this? This so equipment that we are considering. What year was it? 2003. Uh, we have a sense of like what kind of lifespan it, it has. has in it. it has, I think you said, 2000, not quite 2100 hours. So it's got like. What, like said, what does that mean, though, John? That very, very low. I mean, you know, so you, the usage has been very minimal from the time it was new. Yeah. It was in a small, so the guy owns a paving company. You know, so theoretically, he'll go around, sweep what he's about to pave or whichever, you know what I mean? And he's at the point where he's retiring and he's just, you know, he's selling his equipment slowly. You know, I, I found it, I looked at it, it's very clean. He showed me plenty of videos. I mean, it's in a lot nicer shape and it has a lot less leaks, you know, like hydraulic motor than, you know, equipment four or five years old. Um, it's in immaculate shape. I've looked at mm -hmm. a few of them, and I mean, the guy did a really nice job. He took care of it, you know. I mean, you could tell he owned it and he operated it, and he wanted it to last. Mm -hmm. cool. The only reason I looked at it is because of the shape it's in, you know, that between the hours and the miles. It's not like it's got 13,000 miles with the original pumps on it that are about ready to explode. Um, you know what I mean? So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, we we've, we've had um, contracted sweep clean, street sweep sweeping here before. Mm -hmm. um, is it always this expensive? I do we do we know like what we've paid in the past? I, I mean, some of it I think is because of fuel. You know what I mean? Just because fuel prices are high right now, <laughs> and but it's also from what I understand, when a street sweeper comes through, it hasn't always gone every street. You know, they picked a few streets and then just swept them. And you know that's what they could afford, or that's what they could do, so that's all they did. Huh. You, you know what I mean? So I didn't go 
we went around to every street, every sweepable street that we had and looked. I mean, would it cost that much to have somebody just do Main Street? Probably not, but you know, looking at the other streets surrounding as well. Trina, we have a question from the public. Yep, the only other thing I was gonna add to that is it's also a convenience item. So it's there on your schedule. You're not having to work to somebody else's schedule if you already have the equipment. Okay. Right, and, that, and what I was gonna also add is, you know, we could strip it at our own leisure. You know, like we could have somebody come in, two guys for that matter, early in the morning before Main Street got busy and we could go up through and do the congested parts of town when we wanted to. And then we could, you know, kind of get out of town away from, you know, congested areas and just able to bounce around more and take care of more spots at the same time. All right. We had another comment. Yeah, hello, my name is uh, Richard Doolin here. And I have a question for the gentleman that looked at the machine. Was that machine housed in a um, garage of some sort? Yes. Okay, so that's, that's a value right there that the tires and et cetera did not get dry rotted. It was used a fair amount, but not a ton. So the hose, hoses and all that stuff have been well exercised, but not abused. So, you know, on that, I think that's a, a great deal. He's retiring, so he wants to just dump his stuff, and that's, that's fabulous. Um, the other thing on purchasing said unit is, you know, I'm on School Street, and, you know, having the windows open at my house is phenomenally dusty and dirty. If you drive from, you know, jump off the highway, come down the hill, and up to the four-way stop, you start seeing a lot of dirt and muddy water, like during the downpours or, or rain. Those roads are never, ever clean. There's still debris all over them. There's still residue of salt throughout the summer. Um, so that's not a good thing for the general public for their automobiles. So, you know, you, you go through Hanover, you go through Lebanon, those roads are clean right now. It's clean water. If you were down there on, during the downpour, it would be just water, not dirt. So where I'm going with this is I think this is a great deal and something that this town needs. The only thing that I would want the town to think about is lending it out to other towns. If you do that, you send an operator. Well, yes, that's, yeah. You don't, you I'm don't, send if, 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 I'm, if I'm Brookfield DPW, you don't hand it over to me and let me drive it because I don't know what I'm doing. If he's the guy operating it, he's the one that gets subcontracted to the other town at the dollar point that he gets paid, which would be a fair, fair deal for yeah. other towns. It, it'd be a total, total package lend. Right. right. Cool. Driver and equipment yeah. included. All right. Do we have any other comments? If not, we have a motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Back up to Kimball Library's application. Hello. Hi there, Amy Grassnick. I'm the library director. Can you hear me okay? Can anybody hear me? Yep. Yep. I can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, there are actually four grants that I want to report on. Uh, the first of them is a $300 grant from the Department of Libraries. This application already went in, so this is my mea culpa moment to ask if you would retroactively approve applying for this $300 grant for summer reading program support. Shall I keep going? Yeah. They got to quit those little bitty grants. They take more admin time than we get out of them. <laughs> the second uh, grant is a second round of ARPA funds, also managed by the Vermont Department of Libraries. I don't have a deadline yet for when we apply for that. It's about $3,000. The ways that it can be spent are fairly um defined um so i thought i would get a jump on that and see if i could seek approval both to apply and to accept that 
that branch. The third branch is a $50,000 grant request that I'll be sending to USDA Rural Development. This is one that you approved me seeking to help pay for HVAC upgrades. So just FYI, that will go in tomorrow. And the final one, we're going from $300 to half a million dollars. Um, this is the first time that I have put in a request for correct, congressionally directed spending, otherwise known as an earmark. Senator Leahy has invited folks to make requests, I think as his swan song before he retires. The Vermont Department of Libraries encouraged public libraries to make requests. So I went ahead and did that again without um, select board approval. What will happen with those requests is absolutely not clear. There are many paths that earmarks can take. The requests that I made were for um, historic preservation work at the library, and they could end up getting sent to existing grant programs um, with USDA Rural Development, like the Community Facilities Grant that I'm applying for tomorrow. Uh, it could end up with, um, oh shoot, the National Park Service for um, historic preservation. It could end up being bundled together with requests made by other Vermont Public Libraries and the Department of Libraries itself. They could design a new sub-grant program that the, the Department of Libraries then administers, or of course we could get nothing. So just, I guess this is just informational at this point that I went ahead and made the request. We may not know until January or later when the federal budget is hopefully finally determined um, what happened with the earmark requests. So that's what I have to tell you. I think the action that I'm asking for is to approve, um, retroactively approve the application for and approve acceptance of the $300 Department of Libraries grant um, to approve applying for the Department of Libraries ARPA money. And I guess, I guess that's it. So I'll move um, that we approve the acceptance of the, the application for it and the acceptance of the $300 grant for the summer reading program. Second. I have a motion and a second on the uh, summer reading program grant. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained motion carries before we take an, a motion on the next one. I think we need to chat about that one a little. Um, that one has a match requirement, correct, Amy? The three hundred dollar grant, or the no, the five hundred, the five hundred thousand. Um, no, we're so, not talking. So uh, the five hundred thousand dollar earmark request that I put in the ultimate way that could be distributed is completely unclear at this point. Their potential is that my request could be pushed over to the USDA Rural Development Community Facilities Grant program, in which case there would be a 45% match required, assuming that they approved any or all of the projects that I would then apply for. So that's kind of the most expensive scenario. There's also the possibility that the town or the library just gets a $500,000 check. Um, and then there are other possibilities in between, including the Vermont Department of Libraries could get a whole pot of money and decide, decide how to distribute that. Um, we could be directed to the grant program that's administered by the Federal Parks Department, 
Um, I'm not aware of there being any kind of match for those grants. So what, what will ultimately shake out of the earmark request that I made is will be unknown probably until January of next year, assuming that the federal budget doesn't get approved until then. So <clears throat> what you're asking us to approve um, is that you applied for money that you may need another 400,000 in match for? Um, we went to the 45? No. I think what I'm asking for is retroactive approval for me to make this earmark request. I'm concerned though, if it goes into the pot where you need a 45% match, how are you making that match? Because if we approve it, that means the town's on the hook. I don't think the town is on the hook in any way, shape or form because if what ultimately happens is that earmark request goes to USDA rural development, I might actually have to apply for a grant. In other words, this is kind of a preliminary step. <clears throat> it's not really a preliminary step, Amy. The, I think it is. What, what happens is everybody puts in their request <sighs> and each senator is given a, a pot of money, a value, and they pick projects that they want to fund up to that value. And then they figure out which program that project fits into. So what you'll actually know a lot sooner than January. We usually figure find out around July, August, the projects that the senators have selected to be their request through the earmark program. And then they tell you which grant program they're sending you through. So you don't, we don't apply when the earmark comes through, we don't apply for it. We've already got it. What we have to do is then get a better defined scope budget and data together to give to the funding entity that they've chosen that you know best matches what our project is. So, okay, you know, so what, what, what I'm describing is the information that was provided to me by a staffer at Senator Leahy's office. And he emphasized to me that there are many possible outcomes for this earmark request um, including all three or four that I just described. Um, he also emphasized that because the federal budget won't be finalized until January, unless, unless for once Congress gets it done before the fiscal year starts in October, it's like there's nothing certain about this process. That's true. It's not a guarantee until it actually is in the budget bill, but you'll know which projects they're supporting and which funding sources they're going for when they decide which ones they're putting forward. So you'll get a heads up and it's usually, you know, in that July, August timeframe. Hmm. And I've been through it a few times and we've, um, you know, we got four right now that we're going to be, that we're working on. Uh, right. that were awarded this last year. So um, <clears throat> I just am concerned, you know, I think if what you're asking for is retroactive approval because you applied, um, that's one thing as long as it's with the understanding that the town is not committing to any match funding at this time and that there will be a process to figure that out if it's a selected project. We just don't, I don't know, unless somebody else has an answer to this, I don't know where we have the, the worst case scenario level of funding to support a project like that. Trini, if I may ask a question, on the, um, on the item form for this, at the, at the bottom under cost, it says uh, the, cupola, the Cupola Restoration Project is already fully funded, $20,000 grant, 40,000 library funds, 140k town funds if the cds request is approved under the usda grant the hundred eighty thousand dollars in pledge funds would go most of the way to fulfilling 
the 45% match. So with the uh, federal grants, even through these earmarks, you're you have to go through a process by which you submit all your environmental documents and you get cleared for the grant and then your costs are eligible from that point forward unless you can get in there to get pre-award authority. So if they don't have pre-award authority to allow those expenses to be eligible in this grant, then you can't use them as match either. And the ones that I've been involved in until you get through the environmental document process and you get cleared, your expenses aren't eligible. So, yeah, I don't, you know, unless the, there's something that's come in from whichever one of these entities ends up being the granting entity that says all these expenses or will be eligible, or if the library wants to hold off on all those projects to see if they get the earmark and then get them cleared as part of that project for match then I agree that they would be eligible. But the way it is right now, <clears throat> I don't think they're eligible. So I, it's very clear to me that the costs for restoring the cupola are not going to be incurred until next construction season. There's no way they're happening this year. So timing-wise, it seems likely that a, we'll know whether the earmark went through, and B, under what mechanism the money could be distributed. So in a sense, there's no, this is not kind of an imminent decision or an imminent concern. More like, I thought this would be good news, you know, that potentially we've got a half million dollars of revenue that can help with some major restoration projects at the library. It is good news, Amy, but it's not as good news if it comes with a, you know, for, you know, a 55% match. Yeah, and impossible to know at this point. Right, then that's why I think I go back to my comment of if what we're asking for is approval that you've applied, but no guarantee of the town making the match, then I'm all for it. Yeah, that's all I was looking for was retroactive approval. I just wanted to be clear that the town is not committing to making the match on those funds until we know more about what it is. Absolutely. Yeah, that's <clears throat> absolutely true. I'll move that we approve of the grant application for that one. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstained. Motion carries. And then there's the third uh, Vermont Department of Libraries ARPA distribution for just less than $3,000. So it would be great if I could get approval to apply and to accept. I'll move. Uh, 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 that we approve the application and acceptance of the uh, Mont Department of Libraries ARPA funds. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Abstained? Motion carries. Great. Thank you. And fingers crossed that this um, USDA Rural Development Community Facilities Grant that I'm turning in tomorrow bears fruit. I will let you know. Thank you. Appointments and reappointments. So, so Trini, I think we missed the local emergency management plan on 6C. Yeah, we did. I crossed it out already. I was one ahead of it before I skipped. <laughs> <laughs> Consider adopting the LEMP. So we, we mentioned we'd relay any feedback after sending it out. The stuff that I've gotten back to date um, has been about just making sure we update some of the contact changes that have happened and there were two a school and a daycare that aren't in operation that are noted as such in the form itself but there are no other changes that are at least in any of the versions that I've, I've seen the data that are proposed and it's mostly changing essentially Adolfo contact to, to me and a few others you know John's making sure John Shangraz is in there and stuff like that 
So same as last year. Was it's essentially the same document as last year, yeah, last couple of years. Any questions on it? Uh, question. Uh, Rick, okay. Richard Doolin again, emergency management, um, coordinator for this town, director for another town, and uh, director for the county, for the sheriff's department. Um, so that, that document can be updated at any time. So as uh, the year progresses forward and your board members or somebody changes, it's, it's just one easy uh, call to uh, Two Rivers and they can update that, that information for you at any time. So just keep that in mind. And what I saw on there is basically repeating the last few years, um, no big changes. And we do, as a town, we do need uh, to, to sort of find more resources. I have found more resources, um, but haven't put that in there. I've been using it sort of like a uh, tri-town idea with being involved with Brookfield, Braintree, and uh, Randolph Emergency Management and starting to look at taking over the county for a director uh, aspect and sort of just really updating the, the whole system to um, help everybody that's around us, but we do have resources that, like I said, aren't on there, that we do need to put on there for some time. So were you going to get that information to Trevor so it can be updated? Yeah, I, I can get LMP? that to, to him. I, I got to, uh, this will be the third year of um, my contacts of like the food shelf and other local areas that have uh, resources that we can draw from, but just double checking with them, seeing if they're still on board, and we can move forward with that. <clears throat> okay, so you'll be getting to Trevor soon? Yep, as soon as I can make a, a solid appointment with him. <laughs> okay. We're both very busy. Any other comments? If not, I'm saying a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Now we'll do appointments and reappointments. You got an updated list in the packets, and was there another? version after that or that was the that's the most recent that's the most recent yeah and the only other change to note was the okay. uh appointment of tamara morgan to the budget committee as part of this to essentially fill um, the remainder of, of the year until elections are held she was a writing candidate who um, just missed the threshold for the category she was listed in even though her total number of writing votes across the two positions was enough she didn't have them it was four votes shy, I think it was, that ended up being um, of, of election. So that would be the other one that would be in the mix. And then we did try to build out some of the, the list you saw prior was heavy on the advisory committees and, and, and other boards. There's a, a, the yearly appointments list has been included and filled out as well. So um, with some of these committees, um, I think we need to work on doing some updated charges for them um, and kind of get them back focused and help them understand what the expectations are and what we would like to see. Um, we seem to have lost the energy that was behind some of these committees. Um, I'm not sure if refocusing them can uh, kind of bring them back in. And, and that's, you know, some of them need it, some of them don't, like the Water Sewer Committee. Clearly, we don't need to do a new charge for, but maybe the Energy Committee and the Rec Committee um, and Economic Development for starters. Um, and so if anybody wants to, um, to look at a format for that or want some help sort of pulling some ideas together and um, whatnot, I'm more than willing to help. 
do that, but I think we need to, we got a lot of uh, energy when we did the R3 process and we just seem to be losing it. Um, so be good to get some of that back. Yeah, yeah. so pre-COVID, um, pre-COVID, Adelpho was trying to put together, you know, some monthly or, you know, semi-monthly meetings with those committee chairs and I'm just kind of wondering if Trevor has I think we might have discussed this but just curious if we can maybe get back on that track again to try to get them in there so that these different entities know what the other entities are working on and what they're doing and maybe they can assist so what do you think Trevor <laughs> uh, sure I'm, I'm happy to help too I mean I, like you know I kind of you know, but I think Trini's right. You know, there's, you know, we talked about this a little bit there the other night, you know, at the ARPA committee meeting, we were talking about projects and we did circulate that R3 document and, you know, just going back through that and kind of refreshing that in my head, um, you know, COVID has definitely took the wind out of our sails here. And so I think that we need to kind of figure out how to reboot that. And I think there's some people that are working on some projects and I do know that our ADC did engage um, some of the downtown business people together for a meeting a couple weeks ago, and I heard some you know, some good energy that came out of that. So I think uh, it would be a good idea if we could figure out how to drag a few of these groups together again. So I think some of that starts with uh, maybe looking at some of the vacancies we have and see if we can't target some people that might be able to bring some energy to these committees. And I don't have any magic names tonight. No. <laughs> Neither do I. But I'm thinking there's gotta be, there's gotta be something out there. And I think there's some work that they can both do. I actually sat and started writing a list of things that I thought um, kind of that we could be looking at and and committees that maybe could do some projects together that might start some some new energy and whatnot and I you know I think like the rec program and the conservation committee um, you know we got some town forests that could use you know that people don't ever use some over on this side of the hill that you might find somebody once in a while up in there um, that recreation and conservation could work together. Yeah. Just to try to, you know, the recreation committee and the East Valley community group would be a good one to put together. Um, yep. You know, the energy committee working on the town building audits and doing something around community plans, which could involve all the other committees also. I think there's. We do need some folks for the Economic Development Committee because we've taken a substantial hit there. We've lost, um, you know, some some participants in that area. So we're going to need to need some uh, some new blood over there. Yeah. Looking at the energy committee, that's down. We've got three members left on there. Yeah. So I don't know if anybody has any people in mind or anybody's come forward wanting to be on those committees tonight, but you know, I must think we're going to have to do some target recruiting. <laughs> I would agree. Did we have anybody with any names come forward on any of those committees? Not that we've seen, not that I'm aware of. Okay. <clears throat> hey, this is Scott. Yeah. I would be interested in the Economic Development Committee Council. So tell us how you're going to bring energy to that committee. In action. Well, I've already like started action. discussions with. I've had discussions with Mr. Hooper already, 
about the possibility of a river walk from the town forest or the RACDC property all the way up to Brook Street, including the property at the foundry. Mm -hmm. so that's recreation, conservation. Plus, my chef is wanting to work with the Randolph High School students um, that are doing the culinary program, not the technical school, but the high school. And I also have my prototype shop that they've shown interest in sending some students through right here on Prince Street. Nice. I know Ken Cato really well. Yeah, unfortunately, Ken is leaving the community here and he's no longer on this economic development committee after he leaves. So that's why we're, we got a little hit there. But I mean, the things you're talking about, um, Scott, are, you know, those are more, you know, if you're going to have a relationship with the school, you know, for those things, I mean, they need to be talking with Felicia uh, Allard down there on those issues. So that's more related to that kind of thing. The Riverwalk project. Um, you know, that's something that's been in the works for a long time, but there's a landowner issue there. So, you know, I've been trying to work on that, trying to get that taken care of, but it's a pretty difficult situation to change. So that's why. So what am I hearing? I'm hearing, I'm hearing that you do not want me on that council. No, I'm not saying that. I just think you submit a letter and, you know, we can take, but what you're talking about are not things that are related to that council. So that council you know, is is, a, is supposed to be in support of the economic development coordinator, which now we're seeking a new one. We'll be looking for one as soon as Josh leaves. But, you know, the initiatives you're talking about right now are, as Trini just said, you know, that's recreation conservation for the Riverwalk project and, you know, partnering with RECDC. And, you know, those other are definitely, you know, those are part of the technical career center over at the high school. So, I mean, those are projects that you need to work with them on. We don't have any jurisdiction or any opportunity to really influence anything that happens at the career technical career center. So Scott, some of what that committee would look at is ways to um, organize folks around uh, solving childcare challenges and looking at ways the town could help with grant funding and um, different pieces. Well, is the town aware that before I opened the restaurant, I, I had considered an adult daycare center and um, there was no interest from the town? What's an adult daycare center? So, no, never mind. Withdraw my request. I, I don't want to be on that council. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, at this point, we the changes we have are people that have been identified in the various um, positions. Was it highlighted in red? I assume. <laughs> the, the reds are still. A, a vacancy, a note on a vacancy, a new appointment, or a question. So I think looking at the names, the reds are. The, the reds on the first page are people that have been identified to be in those slots. Right. But we had not voted on them yet because they weren't right. in the first batch that we got. So is there any concerns over anybody in that first page? Trini, Milo Cutler does not need to be appointed to Lister. She ran for Lister and won that at town meeting. That doesn't have to be on there for Lister. Okay. Okay. We temporarily took care of the two ZA pieces earlier tonight. But those eventually, when we do fill that, we'll have to, we'll be back for that. Unless it's permanent. Permanent interim? <laughs> Let's hope not. Well, well, right. He's taking on Woodstock too, so. Yeah. He's gonna have his hands full. Any other questions or comments 
on the list. Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion to appoint um, everything on the list except for the lister because she doesn't need to be appointed. So moved. So moved. <laughs> we'll call that a motion in a second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Adopting the annual be transforms. Are we going to do budget committee person under the? Mm -hmm. yeah, I was going to ask you, did, was, were you including Tim or Morgan in the appointment list? We'll make sure it gets noted, or did you want to do a separate motion to? I think we should do separate since it's an elected position that we're appointing a person to until next town meeting. Is that a motion? I would nominate um, Tamara Morgan for the, it's the three year term, but it's till next town meeting. I'll second that, but I, I have a question. Also, who are the vacancies? Tamara no. has been in this position already. Right. It was on the budget committee. Oh. Okay. And I think it was what. There's reference to their. Right. Dave Silloway seat, I think, is the yeah. other one. Or right. it had been Dave's until February or whenever it was. Right. It's the one remaining vacancy if you appoint him. So is it, there's a two year vacancy that's available for somebody that's interested. Right. So I'll second, I'll second the, the motion, pass motion on Tamara. Thank you. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thanks. Motion to Before we move on, Trini, I just had a quick question. Um, if you continue on with the list here on page two, the entire design review advisory commission is highlighted in yellow. I just wondered what that means. I did that because there was a question about whether this even still needed. That just came uh, up as a question. And okay. So I just put it in yellow. Yeah. I haven't had much to do with it for a while. No, sure. Any questions on the detail forms? We have those in the room for the three of you here to sign so we can submit them. You wouldn't mind. Presuming you approve, they're required, so there's not really much of a choice. <laughs> Entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. A bit permit. This is. Yep. One, one for the 4th of July parade, one for the high school club, and one for Slab City Mountain Bike. Is there a reason to take them separate? Anybody have any objections or questions on any of them? Hearing none, I'll take the motion to approve them all. I moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Any other business? Do, do you want to just think about the liquor license meeting after rather than go into executive session and have your conversation come out and have that time? What if we got to the end of the regular meeting, you recessed the meeting you're in, became the board of liquor control, did that one, closed it out, and then you could resume your meeting and go into executive session. That way nobody has to wait for anything at that point? I was going to make exactly that suggestion. So, <laughs> great minds think alike. I was going to be aware. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, like, so, is there a manager's report? I was. Yeah. Yeah, that was my thought, too. Just <laughs> well, I knew that he's. The forge is waiting for the liquor. So, yeah, why not? In case yeah. we have others, too. Um, yeah. Just a quick note, I wanted to, under the assembly permits, we call it out in the uh, in the town manager's report, but uh, one of the write-ups was provided by Will Weiss, who's been our intern from the UVM, what we call it the Local Democracy Project. 
Um, he's been working on a project on fire sale. We got really lucky, I think, with the assignment. What a, a great guy, very diligent, asked good questions, was engaged throughout, asked if, you know, as part of the project, if you do contribute something to an agenda. So very thankful. He's a senior and getting closer to the end of his semester and wrapping everything up. So we're, we're pretty happy. This is still an early set of, um, it's still early in that program. They're still trying to figure out all the all the different components to it, but we've already said that we'd be interested in next fall as well if they have enough students um, and we keep going. So it's a positive experience for us for sure, and hopefully for Will, and uh, wish him luck in his next endeavors. But what did Will do? He, uh, most of the project was centered on on, um, on some research around sort of far sale and the, the ski hill project. So it maxed a little bit, but you know, Larry was after what we had available and in, in, in his interests, um, and then with some general tasks like this one and, and some regular meetings. And, um, so it was kind of a neat idea, and I'm glad we could be a part of it, and certainly happy that we got Will out of it. Um, we didn't realize he had a little bit of a mustache until he finally came in unmasked. We only seen him masked up until, until the last time we saw him. Um, and then the other one was it mentioned that the North Wells and Reservoir Project, we had the bid opening today at two. We had one bidder. Um, we had been thinking, when originally this project a couple of years ago went out, we were under the $2 million mark. I think we were in the one six to one eight range. The December estimate brought that up to about $2 million, um, at least, if not $2.2 million. Um, so we were going to have a bit of a challenge because we have about $2 million in funding when you think of the SRF loan as approved, the Northern Borders Grant, and the CDBG funds that I think were available as well. The bid that came in today, and it Trini sort of, um, I think, hinted in this direction with road projects, was about $3 million. So we've seen that cost from December to now jump up even yet again. So we've seen, you know, from the start of the project to now, it's anywhere from 1.2 to 1.4 million dollars in additional cost. In addition to not sure what the timeline would be because we're hearing certain materials or there's quite an order um, window you have to be thinking of. You know, ductile iron for other projects has been quoted as at least six months out if you can get it at all and, and, and depending on the price. So we're at about $3 million. Where this leaves us in terms of what do we do next, where we go next is still, because this is pretty new. I'm gonna to talk to Naomi with Dufresne Group tomorrow at some point. There's the possibility when we went through some of the early rounds of funding for the SRF program, so that's the, the biggest component of our funding, the million and a half dollar loan. We hadn't completed an income survey yet. That's been done, submitted. So there might be some subsidies and other things that can help lower, um, or at least provide some way to cover some of those costs. Unlikely, certainly couldn't value engineer $1.2 million out of it, because this project scope is fairly spartan as it is. We're not talking about a lot of um, complicated and or uh, additional pieces. So those came in, not shocking, still a little disappointing. So we'll know a little bit more maybe about some potential funding scenarios. And we're gonna try to dig in a little bit to at least get a rough idea of what a schedule could be. Um, you know, obviously not asking anybody to give us a timeline when you, you know, in the ground when you're out, but are we talking this summer or next summer, really, is, is sort of, um, you know, what's feasible um, at this point? Because that was one of the questions that came up in the, in the pre-bid stuff was, you know, how attached are, are you to, to the summer of 22? Um, so we'll keep you posted, but that was the piece of news on that. And based on what everything's been doing with bids everywhere, it wasn't entirely shocking. And, um, so yeah, so just, just the one bidder, and, and we thought we might have two, and only the one, so. Can you tell us who that was? It was Kingsbury Construction, out of primarily out of Waitsfield, and <coughs> some offices in Middlebury too, I think. They're doing a few projects like this. I'm trying to remember if they're involved in the one down in Royalton, there's a wastewater project, for example. Um, it's underway right now. So we'll keep you posted, hopefully there's good news from the subsidies from, but it may mean that we need to dig in and figure out if we're, we're off a year, what does that mean? In addition to trying to make up that cost delta, you know, our northern borders funding is set to expire in the fall, so we have to see about an adjustment to, to that timeline. And thankfully, we're early enough out. 
Because we needed more wrinkles thrown at us. We <laughs> 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 provided, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, we always need Testing those. our adaptability, that's all. Resilience. That's always what we call it. I'm all for permanent press. <laughs> <laughs> that was all I had uh, for reference. <laughs> I entertain a motion to recess the select board meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Call to order the Liquor Control Board. First up is public comment. This is on anything that's not on the agenda. Hearing none, we'll move to approving the agenda. Would you approve the agenda? <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. New business is considering the liquor license renewals. Is there any reason we can't take them all as one? Not that we have. Entertain a motion to approve the whole lot. So moved. So moved. Second, whatever. And then a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Any other business for the liquor board? Hearing none, entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. We will now open back up the select board meeting. Entertain, um, before we go on to the next one, uh, Trevor, we have to, we have to first have a motion that finds we need to go into executive session and then a motion to go into executive session, is that right? Yep. Yeah, we've we've there's a category of executive session items where we should have the finding first. So we've got a couple that that hit that marker, um, and so you're just essentially finding that it's necessary, and the language is sort of the standard from VLCT. Modified for our first, purpose here. First, we'll entertain the motion to find that we need to go into executive session. I will move that we find that we go into ex executive session. Um, I don't know if that's sufficient wording. Oop, yeah. That premature general public knowledge regarding the executive session topics would place the town at a substantial disadvantage. What he said. <laughs> second. Anybody want to second that? Uh, very good. Very good. good. Okay. All right. I missed that. A motion in a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Stained? Motion carries. And we'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We'll take a five minute break and go into executive session. Sounds good. <laughs>